Okay, it's uh, 8 o'clock on a Friday night, and I just posted on Facebook a picture of me sitting in my chair with a blanket over my legs and a heater right beside me, and the post said, um, let me see. Oh, how life changes. 29 years ago, I was a young Peace Corps volunteer living a life of adventure in Africa. Now I'm trying to stay warm and getting ready to record a lecture for AP Chemistry on rate determining steps. Hashtag social distancing. Hashtag exciting Friday nights. So, yes, kids, it's a Friday night and I'm choosing to give a lecture on rate determining steps. How exciting is that? Okay, so... Let's talk about this whole concept. So imagine, if you will, you have like uh, three funnels, okay? So you got kind of a mid-sized funnel, and then you've got, that's going to feed water into a really, really smaller funnel, and then that's going to feed into this big monster-sized funnel. And you begin to pour water into here. Okay. So the water is going to come through this first funnel pretty quickly. But then it's going to create a bottleneck here. So this is going to be flowing out very, very slowly. Now, when it hits here, ah, no worries. So this bigger funnel down here can handle what's going to happen up here with this smaller funnel. But what's going to slow down how much water you can put into this bigger funnel is how much water you can get out of the smaller funnel. So this is a rate determining funnel, okay? Which means that no matter how hard you try, this is gonna determine how much water you get out at the end. Doesn't make any difference with the size of this one up here, it's always this one. So here's what's going to be important is that any reaction cannot go faster than the slowest step. Okay, so let me say that again. Whatever your slow step is, that determines your rate. Okay, so you cannot go faster than the slowest step. Okay. Now, here's the other thing that you're going to have to take a leap of faith on, is that you all are used to reactions happening just in one step. You all are used to saying, oh, we're going to take hydrogen, and we're going to react that with oxygen, and we're going to get water, okay? Or magnesium is going to react with hydrochloric acid, and we're going to get magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas, okay? That's the mindset that you all are used to. But the leap of faith that you have to take is that in these very in these more complex reactions, they don't happen in one step. So first thing we have to do is get used to some terminology. Now, I have sent all of this to you as in, in your emails, okay? So don't worry about writing this down. I'm going to send you all of this because I'm, I'm just that nice a guy. I'm not going to make you copy this down. So... The whole key to this is this definition right here, this rate determining step, okay? So which basically is what I just said, is that your slowest step is going to determine the overall thing. Now, sometimes what you'll create is what's known as an intermediary. So what happens with these intermediates is that you create them, but then they get used up right away. So notice what's happening in this one. So I've got, in this case, two nitrogen dioxide molecules that are colliding, and we're going to produce an NO3 and nitrogen monoxide. So this is your slow step. So right away, I know this reaction cannot go faster than what's going to happen in this step. So basically, what's going to happen is that this is going to be a slow step, and you're going to, slow, you're going to produce nitrogen monoxide very slowly. But... As soon as this thing gets produced, boom, then this NO3, hold on, the NO3, not the NO, the NO3 is going to get consumed and react with carbon monoxide. So 
this is going to be produced, but as soon as you produce it, it's going to get used up. So it's kind of like your mom makes the best chocolate chip cookies in the world and you're starving. So mom pulls out five chocolate chip cookies right out of the oven and it took her forever to make those five chocolate chip cookies. But as soon as they get out of the oven, boom, you're going to consume them. So the slow step is mom making the chocolate chip cookies. But as soon as mom makes those chocolate chip cookies, hey, you're off to the races. Okay, now a little bit of, this is just general terminology. The AP exam generally doesn't use these terms, but I just want to kind of throw them out to you in case you see them. Because a lot, like your book talks about it. So molecularity, which is just, in my opinion, just a fun word to say, maybe it's because it's a Friday night and <laughs> I'm liking the word molecularity. Anyway, so molecularity just tells you how many species have to collide. So if it's unimolecular, one molecule. So this can only happen like with decomposition reactions, okay? So for example, you have hydrogen peroxide decomposing into water and oxygen, okay? Now, bimolecular is when there's a couple of ways you can do this. You might have a couple of the same molecules that have to collide. So let's say, for example, you're going to produce o ozone. Okay, so o oxygen is going to turn into O3. So you've got to have three of these combining to produce O3. Or O3 decomposes to produce three oxygen molecules. So bimolecular is that you can have two of the same thing. Or termolecular, you could have three of the same thing. So that rate would be based upon... The concentration is A. The other way that you can look at bimolecular is that you can have two different things that are going to collide. So maybe you have magnesium and uh, hydronium ions that are going to go through like a single displacement reaction. Termolecular, these are pretty rare, mainly because of the fact that if you visualize this as being like a lock and key where things have to collide just right for it to fit, the problem with termolecular is that for that to happen, you'd have to have three molecules colliding just right for that reaction to take place. So that doesn't happen very often. It can, but it's pretty rare. Okay, so here's how this thing is going to play out. And I'm going to go through this whole thing, and you'll see how it's going to work. So if an, an elementary step, reaction rate can be determined by its molecularity. So here's what you all are used to looking at. So if I gave you, let's say for example, 2H2 plus O2 yielding two waters. So if this reaction happened, okay, and, and this was a one step, you could say, oh, this rate is going to be some constant based upon the concentration of hydrogen squared times the concentration of your oxygen, okay? It's an elementary step. We look at the molecularity. Oh, there's a two in front of that. That's going to get squared. There's a one in front of the oxygen. That's just to the first power. Hey, life is good. Now, here's the problem. When you get into these more complex reactions, you're going to look at a reaction, but what you're going to look at, based upon how the reaction happens, doesn't fit with the observed rate law. So this is what you're going to see in this lab that you're going to start on Monday. So what you'll see is that you might have a situation like on that very first elementary reaction where, you, where something's a zero order. So if something's a zero order reaction, you still have to have it, but it's not, but the reaction isn't dependent upon that concentration. So what that means is that there has to be something hidden within that mechanism because it's not dependent upon that particular reactant. So let's just kind of look at a simple example here, okay? So what we've got here is that we've got A plus A yielding X, and this is a fast reaction. So what this means, and here's going to be importance of this double arrow, this means that this thing can create an equilibrium step, okay? because that arrow goes back and forth across like this. So what's going to happen is that A is going to combine with A really, really quickly. 
and that's going to happen and we're going to produce a lot of x. Now, here's the problem. The next step is going to be really, really slow, okay? So we're going to produce x, but what that means is that we're going to build up a lot of x very, very quickly because we can't consume it in this next step. So the next step is x is going to combine with b, d o c plus y. Then this is going to be your slow step, but then we're going to have another fast step. So as soon as we produce y, boom, it gets consumed. So what that means is that we could, we could detect the presence of x, okay? Because it's going to build up and it's going to reach this equilibrium point. But we won't detect the presence of y because as soon as y is produced, it's going to get consumed down here. So this is why when you produce intermediaries, a lot of times you don't write them in the reaction because you produce them, but yet they're consumed. So just because we might not be able to detect the presence of Y here, that doesn't mean that, it's, that it can't happen. It's just that it's produced so quickly, it's just consumed. So it's like, you know, mom bakes the chocolate chip cookies, you consume them right away. Your sibling comes in and goes, hey, what are the chocolate chip cookies? I'm pretty sure mom baked them, but you can't see them because of the fact that they've been consumed. So here's how this plays out. So I'm going to kind of erase this for a second so I can kind of start writing it again because I need this document here. So let me kind of make this go away. And I'm going to change this when I'm going to write a little bit smaller. Okay, something like this. And that's just going to bug me until this goes away. Okay, much better now. All right. So, a couple of things how when you get reactions like this, you want to come up with like the overall reaction. So, what you do is you cross out your intermediates. So, I'm going to cross out X because those are going to get used up. And then uh, I'm going to cross out this Y because that's going to get produced and that's going to get consumed. So the overall reaction here, and, and this is what we're going to get into on what's called Hess's Law. Well, you're going to add these together. So you're going to take, and, and you all did this with half reactions before when we were doing redox reactions. So I've got 2A plus 2B yielding C plus D. So based upon this as an overall reaction, this should be based upon the concentration of A squared times the concentration of B squared, okay? Based upon what we're seeing. This is what this should be. But when we start to manipulate the reactions, what we figure out is that the rate is actually based upon the concentration of A squared times the concentration of B. So based upon the overall reaction, this is what the rate should be. But when we actually look at what we observe, when we change like the concentrations and we get the, the, the rate law, we actually end up with this. So what we have to end up with is a mechanism to explain why the rate law is only based upon A squared times B and not A squared times B squared. Would This would be like a fourth order overall reaction. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this to end up like this, okay? So again, I'm gonna erase all of this, so be cool, be cool. It's on video, you can go back and rewind it if you, if you, if you really wanna watch it, okay? All right, so here's where the magic happens. So we're gonna start with this idea that this is going to be, this can reach an equilibrium point. So when something reaches an equilibrium point, the two rates are going to be equal. So we're going to call this the rate forward equals the rate reverse because of the fact that it can reach an equilibrium point. So I'm going to write this as some rate constant, F, okay, for the forward reaction, times the concentration of A times the concentration of A is going to equal K in the reverse times the concentration of X. Now, I did this because of the fact that I want this, to, even though this happens very quickly, 
I get a buildup of X, which then allows this reaction to reach an equilibrium. Okay, so that's going to be key. This can reach an equilibrium. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for X. So I'm going to have K forward divided by KR times A squared is going to equal the concentration of X. Okay? Now, this is just going to get a number. Even though there, there are two different values of K, the K forward and the K reverse, this is just going to get me some number. So don't get hung up on going, Mr. Burkamp, what are those numbers? I don't know what the numbers are. I don't care what the numbers are. All I know is that that's going to get me a different value for K. Now, now I want to go down here and we're going to go, okay, well, this is the slow step. Since this is the slow step, that determines how fast this reaction can take place. So based upon this slow step, this is going to be the concentration of X times the concentration of B times some rate constant is going to equal the value of R. Now, here's the problem. I can't have X in my rate determining step because X is an intermediate. I produce it and then I consume it. Oh, it's going, wow, this is complicated, okay? No, really, it's not. So what we're gonna do is, when it, but up here, we said that, and this is where the magic happens. Up here, we said, oh, okay, that's kind of cool, right? So this is this concentration of X equals all of this. So we're gonna do a little substitution to come in here and go, bam, we're gonna put this in here. So this is gonna be some K, right? multiplied by another k, which is oddly enough going to wait, is going to give me, wait for it, just another k. So I've got k over f times k forward times this random value of k. It's just going to get me another k. But here's what's most important. So then I'm going to have a squared times the concentration of b equals some rate. So what's going to happen here is that this now matches this observation that your overall rate is some k times a squared times the concentration of b. So this step right here, okay, where you have a squared times b, this explains, this set of mechanisms explains why it's only dependent upon the concentration of a squared times the concentration of b. That's the most important step. Now, you can do the same thing down here. So here I've got NO2. Okay, this step is a little bit easier. Okay, that's an intermediary. That cancels out. So this is my slow step, right? So if you come in here and you do this and you do this substitution, this process that I just did, and you say, oh, okay, right? Since this is my fast step, that can, e e reach, that can reach an equilibrium. So that's going to be K times NO squared. It's going to equal some k times into O2, but I can't have into O2 in there, so I'm going to solve for that, and I'm going to get k forward times k reverse times the concentration of NO2 squared is going to equal into O2. So then I can take that and put that into there, and life is going to be good. And then what we end up with our overall rate then is R is going to equal K times NO2. Hold on, I screwed that up. K times NO squared times the concentration of br2. So that matches this, even though we're producing this into O2, it's an intermediary, it cancels out. This allows us to determine that this thing is based upon the concentration of NO2, or NO squared times br2. Okay, so that's kind of the general idea on this whole thing. So uh, I'll send out the assignment and part of it's going to come from your book. Most of it's going to be a worksheet that I've developed. 
this is pretty straightforward, uh, but it is kind of cool because this allows us to explain why some reactions aren't as simple as they seem and why it might be zero order with respect to one and where you wouldn't expect that based upon the overall reaction. So anyway, kids, it's uh, Friday night. I've enjoyed spending the last 25 minutes with you explaining this and I will see you.